so that was like very affirming. I can't do this, I hate crying publicly. Hey guys, it's me. <laughs> I am so nervous to do this video because I think I'm gonna cry and oh, here I go. Okay, I'm not gonna cry, I'm not gonna cry. This, I'm never gonna make it through this video and this is the first one I'm filming today. Um, okay, so as you've seen by this like mysterious title and thumbnail, I have some personal news that I wanna kind of go through with you guys in a 360 way because there's some info here, um, some excitement here, but also I just kinda wanna practice total transparency with you guys as is, you know, kind of my mission here. Um, but first, as some of you may have sussed out or seen on my social media or honestly seen on the thumbnail, um, drum roll, brrr, I wrote a book, a novel this time. It's so exciting. Who would have thought? Wait, what was that? What's that Paul Rudd like? Look at us. Who would have thought? Not me. Oh my gosh. Look at me. Just wow. Look at this book. It's me, I did it. It's all me. Um, it's called A Perfect Vintage. It's coming out uh, June 6th of this year. And I would love it beyond all measure if you would consider pre-ordering a copy. There's a link in the description. And anyone who pre-orders a copy through um, the videos that I'm doing here on TFD, like I'm putting 25% of the profits back into TFD, so it all recycles. Uh, and just a heads up that anyone who pre-orders the book uh, and sends a proof of pre-order to hello at aperfectvintagebook.com, which is the book's website, I will personally send them the first three chapters right away so you can get started and fall in love with the book. There's also a playlist for the book and you can buy the cover art and there's you know all kinds of good stuff on that website so go check it out um, and I also do want to start this whole conversation by just saying that this will not diminish my presence on TFD I am still extremely committed to TFD I love what I do here um, I plan to continue to evolve my own videos as the years go on I have some big plans for what I want to do I also love producing other shows like Too Good To Be True and some of the other really cool stuff that we're doing here um, but this fiction writing Folly is something that I really love as a side project. I love that it can just be creatively pure because it's not my full-time income, it's not my full-time job, um, and I don't think either has to come at the expense of the other one because, um, let's be clear, I contain multitudes, okay? I can do it all. Um, and even like looking at someone like Hank who has you know his fiction projects that he publishes and does his YouTube stuff and runs complexly, like that man is winning. And I would like to win on a similar level and just in terms of, you know, doing all of the different things I want to do without having to come at the expense of each other. So I just wanted to kind of make that disclaimer um, that I will take a few days off here and there because, you know, we're going to have some events for the book um, that I'll be doing uh, in New York and other cities. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll want to take some time off for, you know, a little bit of promotion and um, doing mailers and marketing and stuff like that. But it's really minimal and I cannot stress enough that I am extremely dedicated to TFD and to you guys. I love talking about money and and I love what we do here every day, so don't worry about me. So I am going to talk about the actual book itself because let me be very clear, this book, she is that girl. Like this is the book of the summer. She is funny, she is smart, she's a little sexy, she's sophisticated, she does it all. Uh, this book is something that I could not be more excited about just like on a purely literary level, but I also wanted to talk about the process because it obviously does have a little bit of an implication for TFD, but I also, beyond just writing it, um, started a publishing imprint and assembled a little team and have kind of gone all in on doing this myself, both financially and logistically, so I wanna talk a little bit about that as well. But also, as I alluded to in the beginning, it has been an extremely emotional process for a lot of reasons. It's obviously emotional because it was a labor of love and to write a fiction book as now I understand for you know all the people who've done it before um, a really uh, intense creative act it's very fulfilling but it's also kind of overwhelming um, but it was also very emotional for me because the process really was a bit of an existential crisis um, through the process of at first attempting to publish it traditionally and um, that whole experience and then kind of what led me to do it on my own which I'll get into I will also just a heads up be doing a full financial breakdown of this process on publication I will be doing a breakdown not just because this was a personal investment 
investment of mine. It's actually the largest financial investment I've ever made outside of buying our home. Um, so I do want to be transparent about that as I am with all of my big financial moves. Um, but also because I have, you know, a group of women that I've worked with and I'm profit sharing with a lot of them. And I just kind of want to demystify the process a little bit and uh, talk about how, you know, there are ways that we can um, maybe approach uh, things like indie publishing in, you know, that we can have more options. Not to say that everyone could do it this way, but for anyone who might be thinking of doing it this way, just kind of giving some insight into the finances and logistics of doing it yourself. So there will be more to come on that. That video will be coming out on June 6th, the day my book is published. And hopefully by then I will have uh, broken even and that will be something to celebrate too, but we'll talk about it then. So first, the book itself, who is she? Who is this beautiful girl? Um, so as you can see by the back of the book here, this is my little, you know, my description of the book, which you can feel free to pause and read. The tagline is old money, younger men, one intoxicating summer. Who doesn't want to spend a summer with this book? I mean, I know I do. Um, but basically, without getting too into it, it's um, a romantic fiction novel, and it follows a 30-something American woman whose job is rehabilitating. There are, many of you may not know, but in France, there are a lot of uh, dilapidated old chateaus and vineyards and estates that have been passed down through families for generations that people don't take care of or they can't afford the upkeep on them. Um, you know, these are people who have, you know, a really, you know, precious piece of land, but maybe don't otherwise have a ton of money um, or just don't give it the time so they fall into disrepair and her job is to go in and turn all of these dilapidated estates into boutique hotels and vineyards um, which is something that happens in real life and I actually through my husband's family have a, a good level of familiarity with the wine production industry and some of all that so there's that whole side of it um, but she ends up uh, bringing her best friend slash cousin and her niece um, hijinks ensue there are love triangles there are wars of inheritance. She ends up falling for one of the sons of her bosses, so a little shocking, a little taboo. Um, but overall, in my opinion, it is just a truly excellent book. It's escapist, but it's still very grounded. It's really well written, in my opinion. Um, it's really fun. It's really interesting. And like I said, it's a little bit scandalous. So if you're just a freak who's like, what does Chelsea Fagan from The Financial Diet sound like writing you know, a love story? Well, your check's clear too, honey. I'll take your money. Um, so you can check it out out of morbid curiosity too. But honestly, on a truly literary level, I could not recommend this book more. I could not be happier with it. But that being said, I do, because this is TFD and because I obviously have cultivated like a pretty, you know, transparent relationship with you guys, um, I did want to talk about the process of doing it myself, why I chose to do it myself, because I have published traditionally twice now and I will probably traditionally publish again for certain things. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to the process of going through a traditional publisher, but I did end up opting to start my own imprint for this one. And I just kind of want to talk about why and um, sort of my feelings on the matter because I do think they have a lot of applications outside of just my particular situation. And for the record, my imprint is called Orsay Press. Dee -dee. Chic, right? So just a little story time. So I had initially written the manuscript. I finished it last summer and I had given it to my agent that I've worked with for, you know, 12 years now, who's, you know, with whom I've collaborated with all of my other books and, you know, upcoming projects as well. And he sent it out to a very, very limited list of editors, just a very few, which was just kind of a way to test the water and see what the response was. And pretty quickly, the responses that I was getting were um, pretty disheartening to say the least. So I wanna choose my words very carefully here because I don't want to disparage anyone and I don't wanna sound insulting to either you know, the publishing uh, professionals that I was speaking to or other authors in the space, but I did feel very quickly that there were some really limiting beliefs about the book that I really disagreed with. Um, Publishing is, as many of you know, it is an industry that is somewhat under duress financially. You know, there are really positive signs in terms of book buying trends, but um, it's also, you know, doesn't always operate on great margins and can be pretty risk averse. And I do understand that a lot of the editors and their teams are under a lot of financial pressure, and that can often result in a pretty narrow adherence to um, the kinds of books that will be published, you know, how genres are classified, um, the marketing of particular books. For example, I read a lot of romance books. You may notice that a lot of them typically have a very similar look. Often if an author has a successful book, their subsequent books are very, very close in, you know, in theme, in marketing, even in cover design and art, um, because that's 
you know, honestly, probably the least risky choice for publishers to make. You also may notice that a lot of books are marketed in terms of uh, the various categories and subcategories they might fall under. Like, you know, this book is enemies to lovers and it's grumpy sunshine and it's, you know, happy for now. And it's, it's a lot of categories that I, from, a, from someone who does work in digital marketing, which I do through TFD, I totally understand. Um, but I also didn't feel comfortable uh, with my book sort of narrowing it into a category that I didn't feel that it should be. Um, there are two categories that my book sort of falls in between. One is women's contemporary fiction, which are typically the more, like they're the books that are in the front of bookstores often. They're more serious, they're more grown up, they're often more literary. And then you have romance as a genre, which is genre fiction, which is often in a separate section of the bookstore. Um, and is, although it is an incredibly successful genre, is often not taken as seriously by publishers. and. What I was hearing from the editors that I was speaking with was uh, this book either has to be a romance novel or it has to be women's contemporary fiction. And essentially here are the changes that need to be made in order for it to be one or the other. And I felt really uncomfortable with that because I think that readers are smart and have an appetite for books that aren't necessarily in one category or the other and that you don't have to follow such a narrow pathway in order to sort of be categorized for one or the other. Um, in one conversation, Emily in Paris was invoked as like something to aspire to. And I was like, this is the bad place. I have to get out of here. Like, and that's, I mean, I would say no shade to Emily in Paris, but like, as I said on Twitter, I mean, a three season long tampon commercial, like I watch it, but I, that's not what I'm trying, like with this book, I'm trying to avoid stereotypes about France and portray like a more nuanced, sophisticated picture of a culture that I really love and have been in immersed in. But so I was getting all this feedback that was really kind of making me despair, honestly, because it was going to result in me making a lot of changes that I didn't really want to make. And so I had a few conversations. It turned out that there was an editor um, at a larger imprint uh, who really loved the book and got it basically and was like, I've been wanting to do something like this, blah, 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 blah. Um, but her higher ups had kind of a similar commentary. And I want to be clear that I was not of the opinion that like my book was perfect and didn't need to be edited. Like it was edited heavily with, you know, the person that I did end up working with. Um, I am not precious about making changes. However, I didn't feel comfortable with those types of changes. So I had a long conversation with a few key people in my life and I was like sobbing for days on end because I was like, I was really scared. And honestly, like this is something I've never said before, but when I was first starting TFD, I was leaving my old job and I had an offer to work at a very big magazine as uh, like a staff writer. And it was a pretty good salary, but it was especially like very institutionally prestigious. And I think in a lot of ways that would have felt a lot better at the time superficially because it took a long time for TFD to become legitimate in a lot of people's eyes. And if I could have just like updated all of my profiles with this magazine, this glossy magazine that I was working at, um, that would have been really satisfying and it would have felt very validating. And certainly to a lot of people in my life, it would have meant a lot. And I'm like, so glad looking back, I didn't do that. Like I probably would have been laid off 10 times by now, first of all, cause you know, magazines are in trouble, but also like, look at TFD, look at all of this. And honestly, without John and Hank Green coming and believing in the project, I probably never would have been able to make the choice to do like the less validated thing. But you know, it was kind of those same crossroads. I have to stop cause I'm gonna cry. <laughs> um, so basically I had a few conversations, including with, uh, my co-founder, Lauren, who I ended up collaborating uh, on with the book as well. This is, the cover is actually an original oil painting by an artist that I love, but Lauren actually designed the whole book. Um, so shout out to Lauren, still works at TFD, we work together every day. Um, but she, you know, kind of gave me that boost of confidence. She was like, you could do this by yourself. Like you could start an imprint, like you have the resources, you know the people, you know how this stuff works. Um, I'm never gonna be able to get through this story. So that was like very affirming. I can't do this, I hate crying publicly. But I also talked to my parents who are just like, you know, my biggest champions. Like they're so, like they're honestly borderline silly. Like they're always like, you're the most impressive, amazing, beautiful, perfect, smart, like accomplished. Like anytime I do anything, they're like, 
what is that Lady Gaga meme? They're like amazing, spectacular, never been done before. Like they are like that about everything, um, which is funny, but also really good for when you're making big decisions. And I talked to my mom about this and she was like, honestly, like if you made these concessions and put out a book that you didn't feel good about, like I would support it obviously because I support everything you do, but I would be disappointed because you've achieved a level of professional and financial success where you have the ability to make what she called the artist's choice and to do something that's more like true to yourself and all of that. And she was like, if you don't do it, who will? And I thought that was really true. I hate crying. <laughs> this is why I wanted to get this out of the way. Okay, we got a little weepy, but we pulled it together. Um, fun fact about me is that I hate crying publicly so much and it just like, as the kids say, gives me the ick so much that I made my husband and I like recite our vows to each other in private one-on-one -on -one, um, the night before several times so that I could just be like <laughs> fully dead behind the eyes <laughs> and get through it without crying because I knew I would cry otherwise. I love him for humoring that. And it was nice to be able to deliver them one-on-one -on -one to each other. But anyway, so my mom said that um, and I was like, you know what? It, we ball. Um, so I reached out to that editor at the big publisher who liked it and I was like, do you want to just do this together and you know on the side? And she was like, yeah. And so we started working on it. I have been working with a whole group of women, but uh, you know I worked with another uh, longtime friend and collaborator as my line editor. I had obviously my cover artist that I commissioned. I worked with Lauren. I have a marketing partner that is so wonderful. Like I have just been having the best time doing this myself and getting to make all these creative decisions and honestly like if i can give one thing from this like one piece of one big takeaway for myself is like institutional validation is a very powerful drug and in industries like mine it is often used to supplement other forms of compensation like you know a lot of people who work at like big glossy magazines for example or you know who have or who work in television like often they're paid almost nothing because they should just be so excited to be there because it's such a glamorous job and it's so it's so well viewed and respected by other people and saying no to that and turning away from it is very difficult emotionally and it is a lot to give up but if you are ever in a situation where the choice is between superficial forms of validation and creative freedom or quality of life or other real forms of compensation um, or doing something you're really passionate about like turning away from that validation is the most powerful way to really center yourself and claim your power and do all of the things that are meaningful to you. Like don't get suckered in by that. There are also a lot of financial benefits to, you know, doing this independently as I have, um, which I will get into in that other video. But like what I can say about it is that like, I've truly never felt this way about any project ever in my life uh, in the sense that I think it's so good and I'm so proud of every aspect of it that like, even if if, God forbid it doesn't do that well somehow like I'm okay with it because I love it so much and I know how good it is and I feel proud of every choice I made so all of that is to say although it would beyond delight me if you guys would consider pre-ordering a copy at you know uh, the link in the description here um, and again if you order through TFD uh, like on this video 25% of the profits do go right back into TFD in addition to all of the profit sharing I'm doing so you're really helping sustain a whole ecosystem here. Um, but even if you don't, if you can't, whatever the case may be, I'm just so happy with it. And I really hope that if you can buy one thing in life with, you know, whether it's gaining financial security, a certain level of professional success, um, or even just a level of stability, like the number one thing you can buy yourself back is your freedom and your options and your time. Um, and this to me was like a really perfect example of that. And although it was really terrifying during that like two week period where I didn't know what I was gonna do and I was really scared at the prospect of doing it myself, like I can't even tell you how much happier I am with, um, with how it came out. I would never consider doing it another way. Um, it absolutely banged. So um, get the book, 
get two, get one for a friend. I mean, uh, enjoy it, love it as much as I did. And just a reminder, if you send a proof of pre-order to hello at a perfect vintage book.com, I will email you the first three chapters of the book so you can start falling in love. Thank you for joining me on this bonus episode. I'm so excited for this project and to share it with you guys. Thank you for being such an incredible community and allowing me the freedom to pursue this project, which I hope that you guys will enjoy as much as I did. All right. Love you guys. Bye.